Welcome to Let's Talk Global Business, the show in which we look at the economic and business trends connecting the world. I'm Sarah Murray, Managing Director International at Conference Board, the member-led global think tank that delivers trusted insights for what's ahead. In today's global landscape, ESG, or environmental, social and governance factors, have emerged as key metrics guiding responsible and sustainable business practices. In this episode, we're going to be zooming on the S or social in ESG to understand its impact and its importance for business. Today, I'm sitting down with two guests who will shine some light on the subject. From Brussels, I'm joined by Paula Byrne, Programme Director of our European ESG Centre. And joining us from the United States is Andrew Jones, Senior Researcher of our US ESG Centre. Paula, Andrew, welcome to Let's Talk Global Business. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much, Sarah. So, Paula, Andrew, the S in ESG, it's a flexible term that encompasses a wide range of factors that influence a company's overall social impact. Could you both please unpack the meaning of S and what it means for business? Sure. And um, yeah, as, as you say, Sarah, it's a very flexible term that covers a wide range of focus areas and issues. And I, I think there's no sort of single universally agreed definition, but it's all to me all about the company's relationships and responsibilities to people you know, and society at large. So employees, suppliers, customers, and, and communities. And I think the perceived importance of these social dimensions has, has grown a lot in recent years for, for various reasons, which I think we'll touch on throughout this podcast. Paula? Yeah, I mean, total agreement with both of you in terms of the, the S and the ESG is, is the people-related topics, which by its very nature are very broad. I think the work that we've been doing at the ESG Centre has looked more at the, the why. So it's critical for each company to define, define their own S. Mm-hmm. And that can be very different, you know, from a tech startup to an agri-food company. The tech startup needs to think probably more importantly about consumers and their engagement with the products and the tech, whereas for an agri-food that's employees in the supply chain um, and where those critical uh, S factors are. Mm-hmm. So I think that's the more the why rather than the, the what. I would imagine also, as well as the sector kind of difference, like the country in which the company's located, you know, the kind of cultural norms and you know, social economic kind of status of that country might also change what they define as S and what's important to them? Yeah, I think that's something that the other thing about S is you can set your people strategy as a company for, for the globe, of course, but it is has to be very specific then in terms of the country, the region, mm-hmm. the social history of the company, yeah. uh, what's important to the company, the, the values, yeah. the culture, behavior of the company. So respecting that and taking, I think you can build a lot on that. Mm-hmm. But then when you're pushing this out across the globe, you have to also then take into the sensitivities uh, in each region, country, the labor laws. Mm. There's a lot of factors mm. in terms of breaking it down from like company, country, um, mm. region. And the messaging. And the yeah. messaging, yes, that's yeah. really key because yeah. you're dealing with people. So we have to yes. communicate with, with people yeah. in, the, in the way they speak and the way they think and their norms. Yeah. So Paula, that you, you co-authored a paper for the conference board zooming in on the S in ESG and in, in that report you know it mentions that the companies like to define the S differently based on like as you just said the size the industry sector and or the location what does it mean for business and how can companies make sense of the social issues? I think that the where the work that we did with the working group and, and the findings were really looking at the specificities of each of each company first, and as I mentioned, the culture and the so building on that. Um, but then you have to take a lot of learning from the sector uh, in terms of because you're dealing a lot with stakeholders, stakeholders perceptions, you know, important stakeholders like the communities you operate in, the uh, consumers that buy your products or services. Um, and as shareholders and um, governments. So that's really important to break that down into, you know, take those into consideration, but building on your own culture and your own specific company, even if in the sector, you know, within the companies, within sectors will differ in their Mm. approach. Yeah, and then from the company, from the country point of view, it's important to think about the specific social issues that depend on from a country's conduct and taking into the, taking into consideration the country's 
level of development, their, their level of government interventions, how much, you know, in terms of, you know, your room to, to play. So if you take within Europe, we have a very strong trade union history. Mm. And that is just a given norm in our daily lives. You yeah. know, in the US, that's a very different situation. Yeah. And outside of Europe, again, very different situations. Yeah. And it can be a very divisive issue if, as you said, the language you're using mm. is misused yeah. in a regional context. And I, I would guess that, that when it comes to the S in ESG, Andrew, it is a fundamental to the company's culture, right? It can't just be a checklist of, of things that the sustainability department do. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I think you're right that... You think the, the S in ESG, it, it ultimately represents the company's social responsibility, right? Whether that's to its own employees or to wider society. And I think, therefore, it, it naturally warrants being integrated into core strategy and, and culture, particularly in, in the current era of, of stakeholder capitalism. And I, I think you could even say that a company's S practices are arguably a barometer for corporate culture, right? So where, where companies have a strong and shared culture across the organization, S practices often tend to be strong. So yes, I think definitely it's not something that can be sort of siloed and seen as a sort of side project. I think it has to be deeply integrated uh, along with sort of sustainability and ESG in, in general. And, and Paula, you know, how, how can an organization build an S strategy? Where do you start? You start with the why of your company. Mm -hmm. You start with what are the key areas, the expectations from, from your stakeholders. And as Andrew mentioned, I think what we also found in the working group and, and the paper that we produced was, and we push on it quite a lot, is that you need your, you need to be strong in your definition of S because it is so very broad. Mm. So you need to start with that strong definition and then it builds confidence. And then it's getting the buy-in of your C-suite. So having a an ambassador, the group talked about, the working group members talked a lot about that in terms of having ambassadors in the C-suite to drive the, um, you know, the policies, the agenda, and the funding that's needed in terms of, you know, achieving certain targets around social and making that, you know, it's, it can be dispersed across the company as well. You know, HR is very dominant in, in people, but as is, you know, you need the finance on board you need uh, you know if it's a supply chain situation you're talking about procurement etc so you're always bringing a, a group together so having that c-suite ambassador um, is really key and that helps you also define key um, targets and kpis you know that are aligned with c-suite so it, it, you know you're keeping that kind of sharp what can we achieve what makes sense to us etc yeah um, and then it's implement learn you know the usual then you go yeah. into the usual role of of learn and learn yeah and and the other thing about people but i mean that's a, an esg issue anyway in terms of it's just continuous learning so yeah. it's you know it's never stopping it's building on what you've learned building on your successes learning from your failures yeah. and starting all over again <laughs> and andrew you know what you, paula just mentioned about metrics you know measurement you know what what are you seeing about how organizations can establish you know metrics to to, to measure their social impact so th this is a great question so i think the s in esg has often been perceived as perhaps being particularly more challenging to measure than than other areas in particular e and and sort of i guess which has more quantifiable metrics sort of emissions and so on so it's definitely seen as a as a harder area to make progress on and i think actually Breaking down your question, you're sort of asking about two two different things here, right? On the one hand, you have social risk that are the potential negative consequences to a, a company's operations or, or reputation that arise from social practices, and also its social impact, which I guess is its sort of the social effect it's having on on the wider social fabrics. But I think I think in either in either area, it's ultimately all about identifying and mapping what's what's really material and relevant to the company, right? Whether it's the risks that are particularly acute or the sort of societal outcomes that you're really trying to achieve. And I think once you've defined those, it's then a case of, of setting sort of credible, realistic KPIs uh, and then tracking progress against those and, and reporting out, right? And I think you, what's, what's really important is having the sort of robust systems for data collection, monitoring, and regular reporting to internal and external audiences. And obviously that, that's... Measurement is really important for many things, including being able to adapt strategies as as needed. Just want to move to the you know the role of the investor and and the regulator because obviously that can have a huge impact on you know the company's reputation, their financial 
performance, how investors are responding to this reality. Um, you know, what what are you seeing in terms of how companies can kind of maintain investor confidence in this space? I can take it uh, first, it, particularly in the working group, um, there was a lot of discussions around investor expectations. Um, what I think, and we still see that, you know, it's, it's a few months now after the working group, but we still see that coming up and again, is investors are not, although they're, they're very, they are asking questions around social, they are more environmentally driven in terms of their mm -hmm. majority of, of focus is on, especially on climate. Mm -hmm. Where they look at social, what's really important for them is the gender equality in boards. Mm -hmm. So the governance right. elements, yes. that's really, and I think that that's been a, a permanent part of it, like a stakeholder or shareholders uh, expectations in the last decade, I would even say. Um, but there's still some ways to go to better understand what's important sector to sector mm. from, a, from a social perspective. Mm. Their understanding of the importance, I think, you know, risks pop up and then it becomes important, but they haven't really thought that through uh, right. in terms of, so there's, there's some ways to go. And th that kind of brought us back to the being very clear on setting your own social strategy, which gives more confidence to investors yeah. in the sense that we've set, we, you set your own tone in a way and you yeah. set your own actions on that and that yeah. was um, but in terms of investors i think there's still a ways to go in terms of understanding and if i if i can just add from perhaps the u.s perspective so i i think i i agree with paula that investors perhaps as a as a whole have been more focused on on the e in esg but i think definitely in the last years we, we've seen you know a, a, a growing recognition of the links between social factors and and companies sort of reputation and, and financial performance and i think that's particularly been the case since you know 2020 when when an array of social issues came to the fore. But I think what we found from speaking with major institutional investors is they're particularly interested in sort of the workforce, right? You know, the health and safety of the workforce, promoting economic opportunity and sort of other bread and butter economic issues. I think investors currently perhaps are less, less infused by companies addressing social issues in, in, in the broader sort of outside of the company's four walls. But it's also worth pointing out investors are obviously not monolithic and Different investors prioritize different social issues depending on you know, their values and, and also the sector that they're investing in. But I would imagine that the S may have quite a different meaning to, you know, for investors than it does for employees. Yeah, I, I think 100 percent, because obviously investors are looking at it from a sort of primarily a financial risk perspective. You know, and, and they're attuned to sort of what what's most important in terms of long term returns and, and risk management and sustainable performance. Employees are perhaps more concerned with you know, their own sort of you know, opportunity and, and the demographic makeup of the workforce and, and sort of the structure and pay equity and issues like that. But I think there's clearly a, an overlap there because many of those issues do contribute to you know, a company's broader risk profile and, and long term sustainability. How should businesses be dealing with, because there's, there's much more demand, you know, for greater transparency, right, on social issues, or there's at least much more debate. Do you do you talk about it? Do you not? Do you take a stance? Do you not? What, what are you seeing there, Andrew? Start with you. Yeah, so I think we're definitely seeing calls for, for greater transparency from a, from a wide range of stakeholders on ESG in general, and then the S specifically. And I think only, it goes back to perhaps the point you made er, earlier, Sarah, that the the S can't just be a sort of you know, a checklist of, of actions, right? That it, that it does need to be closely aligned with core strategy. It needs to be closely embedded within the broader corporate culture. I think, you know, addressing issues that are so complex and, and multidimensional does require a very proactive approach. I would also add that, that part of the calls for transparency are obviously also to do with sort of you know, greenwashing mm -hmm. litigation and, and, and a need for companies to be authentic and transparent on their sustainability commitments and statements right and that that includes the s and actually we're we're seeing the rise of blue washing you know which is which is sort of the the social va variant of of, of green washing saying so in, in this context companies just need to really ensure that their their public disclosures and communications you know are accurate substantiated and in compliance with with legal standards and and obviously be very careful of exaggerating your social impact right i think from a european perspective Two things come to mind that in, earlier this year in the, the TCB survey, we saw a very different set of priorities from the C-suite in Europe to the C-suite in the US. In mm -hmm. the US, C-suite were much more focused on social issues, for example. And that maybe because of regulatory pressures and 
there is a you know quite a fixation on climate transition and energy transition in Europe, but maybe you know with geopolitical issues being more on maybe a European doorstep than than the US. Um, geographically, I mean. Um, but the other thing that I think that's pushing the discussion in Europe is regulation mm. um, and the um, CSRD, the Sustainability Reporting Directive, which is setting very much a high bar on all aspects of ESG reporting. But it, it has, I think, um, put a, a strong definition around social and uh, ring fencing around social for, for European companies or companies that have to report within within the EU. And um, so those are the two things I think that are really helping and overwhelming yeah. <laughs> companies yeah, at the yeah, moment yeah. in Europe. Yeah. So we're going to take a short break and when we come back we'll continue this discussion on the S in ESG and what it means for businesses in Europe and the US. And please note that you can find and explore Paula Burns co authored report zooming in on the S in ESG on our website. Need a practical approach to leading AI projects? Want insights from what other companies are doing? Team up with peers from Europe's leading companies in the Conference Board's AI Forum. We are collaborating to put the power of AI at the heart of business innovation. Discuss how to use AI for business growth. Learn from other success and failures. And discover how to embed generative AI into existing digital initiatives. Join me, Claudio Truzzi, for a hands-on approach to mastering the AI revolution. Hello, welcome back to this conversation with Andrew Jones and Paula Byrne. We're talking about the S in ESG and its importance in C-suite priorities for 2024. I want to turn the discussion now to get some perspective on regional differences. Andrew, let me begin with you. From the perspective of the United States, you know, how, how are businesses addressing the topic of S in ESG that's different, you know, to what we've already discussed? I think as, as we've discussed, you know, businesses are addressing the, the S in an ESG in, in a way that's very dependent on, you know, the firm, its industry, its market position, its customers, and, and so on. But I think there are, there are commonalities here, right? And, and the way that the, the US ESG Center often looks at this is, is the way that companies operate in three different spheres, right? Which is the, the workplace, you know, so their own workforce and operations, the marketplace, so that the products, services, customers, and the public space, which is more around the sort of their philanthropy, their communications and government relations. And and companies are active across these these spheres in on a whole range of things. You know, in, in the workplace that might revolve around sort of employee health and safety, wellness, DEI. I think DEI is a particularly big focus of, of US corporations in particular, which I think perhaps reflects obviously the, the broader sort of cultural context in the US and 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 the, the longer history in the in the workplace. Companies are often sort of emphasizing product safety for customers or uh, protecting human rights in the supply chain is, is a huge issue. Uh, you know, ensuring all supplies go through human rights due diligence. Also increasing spending with with women and minority owned suppliers. I think that's that's an area where where U.S. corporations have been particularly active in, in the last few years, and, and we've seen significant increases in, in spending in, in that regard. Lots of companies have, have really committed to supply diversity. And then in the public space, I think we, we really see U.S. companies active in their, their corporate citizenship and philanthropy efforts, right, to, to, to tackle systemic social issues in, in the communities where, where they operate. And, and that might be issues as diverse as economic development, you know, health, hunger, Etc. So it's it's uh, it's really been very active, and I think the U.S. companies in particular have a, a very long-standing expertise and commitment to corporate philanthropy. That again, I think is it reflects something perhaps quite distinct about the U.S. corporate culture and the broader sort of regulatory and social environment. Yeah, and can can you give me an example of a U.S. company that's doing really well in this field? One I did want to touch on is is, is actually Walmart because. Obviously, Walmart is one of one of the largest corporations in the U.S. and and also has a you know, physical presence in so many different communities, right? So it's it's out there, really visible in terms of its its social presence and impact. And and Walmart actually, it, it's what what I think's worth pointing out about Walmart is that its its ESG strategy kind of it, it's organized into broad pillars, but it doesn't sort of silo 
S, you know, it doesn't put the social to one side. It actually embeds social considerations throughout all of its ESG work, right? So there's a, there's, to give you an example, there's a pillar of their strategy on opportunity, you know, and under this, Walmart emphasizes providing sort of inclusive and equitable opportunities for employees. And that includes subsidizing college degrees, which has been a really, really interesting intervention. Under its sustainability pillar, Walmart includes, you know, includes a lot of environmental work, but also responsible sourcing and addressing risks in the supply chain. And then under its community pillar, Walmart has a, a hugely robust corporate citizenship and philanthropy agenda. I think they actually made close to $2 billion in, in cash and in-kind donations worldwide last year and, and you know, tackling all kinds of systemic issues. And I think the point here is perhaps that, that collectively this all adds up to a very comprehensive and holistic approach to the S in the in the ESG that is that is always closely linked to the core business and its material priorities. So uh, I think it's, yeah, Walmart are doing a good job in this space, but many other companies are too, for sure. Paula, let's let's turn to, to Europe. You know, obviously, as you, as you mentioned in January 23, the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive came into force. There's more detailed reporting set to commence in 2025. What are the effects of this and other regulations having on European businesses? I think regulation is the word in Europe, <laughs> in the ESG centre mm. anyway. And the CSRD, the reporting directive, has kick-started, I think. And, and we're hearing that from our CSOs uh, in particular, but also our CFOs, that this is very much centre in their agendas. Organisation around reporting, reorganisation, restructuring, looking at how best to you know, structure their reporting, bring that finance and um, sustainability reporting together. As I mentioned, the CSRD, I think, has, from a social point of view, has very nicely defined social into four areas. And that's your employees, your supplier employees, your communities, and the consumers and end users of your products or services. Um, And I think in that, there's other regulations, of course, coming into play. We have probably the most important one, to be signed off any day now, the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Mm. uh, Directive, which brings into law basically what companies have been operating under um, the United Nations Guiding Principles and the OECD guidelines. So it's not that it's bringing in a lot of new stuff, but it's, it's bringing it in in terms of legislation, and it's for the first time being legislated in Europe. Where we see our members are, they're moving now, um, and we'll be starting a group on that, a deep dive session on operationalizing human rights. So they want to move from, okay, this is the policy, we you know, we know what we need to do, but it's the how we do it, uh, and really looking to work together in terms of, and I think that's in the social space, particularly in the supply chain collaboration is really key to understand what others are doing, how others are working. What we're hearing from members as well in terms of working on social issues is that they see it as a way to unlock collaboration in other areas. So that there's scope three emissions, mm-hmm. which is really important. Mm-hmm. You know, we have you only have one supply chain. You don't have multiples. You need your scope three emissions. You need your social data and compliance information. Uh, you need the collaboration with the same suppliers for all, for all of these. So that's, I think, really moving into operationalizing this is, is where... We are hearing from European companies. We run C-suite Outlook every year and we survey, I think, close to 2,000 CEOs and C-suite executives from around the world. And our 2024 survey showed that CEOs in the US and worldwide cite education as their top ESG priority. Why do you think that is? I'll start with you, Andrew. Sure. Yeah, it's it's a it's a really interesting mm-hmm. finding, right? And I think it's also interesting because uh, actually they also ranked economic opportunity and equality as a number two, right? So you actually you actually see here sort of really fundamental social issues being ranked higher as ESG priorities than you know than perhaps your conventional E areas, including climate change and reducing emissions. So it's a really fascinating finding, and I think perhaps the reason why education ranks so high, particularly for US CEOs is that it, it aligns with the, the broader perhaps C, CEO and C-suite priorities of attracting, retaining and developing talent. And I, I don't think it's a coincidence that CEOs in the US and globally also cited attracting talent as their number one internal yeah. priority for 2021. I think there's an obvious relationship there, right? That that a recognition that the industries and skills of tomorrow's workforce are rapidly evolving. 
you know, including technological advancements, changing business landscapes, and, and investing in education is perhaps perceived as the, as the critical way to cultivate you know, that, that agile and adaptable workforce that is equipped with the necessary skills, including, of course, digital skills. So I think that's why you see it rank so high. And I, I suspect we'll continue to see a similar trend in the years to come. Yeah. It didn't rank as highly in Europe. This one, the one region that it didn't, which was this two. <laughs> I had the same surprise as, as Andrew when I saw that education was on top and a nice surprise. Um, and we are hearing from our C-suite members that talent is really a key issue. Talent retention. Talent retention. Yeah, and, and talent attraction. Yeah. Both yeah. really key, and especially in the ESG space, because it is an area that probably we are lacking some skills. Mm. It's still a quite a new area, mm. but it, it comes up in almost every conversation. So as we wrap up this discussion, let me ask you both, what's your top takeaway from this discussion that business leaders should focus on, Paula? The why of the social. I think I have, I have banged on about it a bit, but I think social, as we, we have discussed as well is often seen as the one that's difficult to measure the one that's difficult to define social can be everything because it's people it's us um, but i think that you really need to look at your company your culture your why you know your history is also important there is a lot of push uh, and it's very often very intense discussions maybe in the public sphere but it's important to root with your company your sector and your where your um operating mm. and what makes sense mm. and then i think you just build confidence throughout the company and to your yeah. to your shareholders and stakeholders yeah andrew i think i think you know there's a lot of challenges with the s and esg writing including some that the paula just mentioned around being perhaps difficult to track and measure and define and so on but but i guess my, my big takeaway would be that the companies that are, are proactive on the s and esg have, have a real business opportunity right to to enhance the reputation and establish themselves as leaders in in this space and i think this proactive stance has has real competitive advantages right whether it's around attracting talent attracting customers attracting investors uh, and ultimately businesses that lead in sort of bringing about transparent impactful social initiatives can really differentiate themselves and achieve sustainable growth so this is this is a really key area to focus on for sure yeah excellent excellent so yeah i mean again i i would say yeah the why of social alignment on the definition again that really you know stands out to me to make sure everyone understands what we you know what the company is trying to do like what i also took away is again the importance of the sponsors you know for the funding and everything but i do think again it's not just the chro or the chief sustainability officer right it takes a village and in order to to really make sure that you get the you know that that culture you know, there's there's a lot of work that needs to be done on communication, on the results, on the transparency. You know, and like you said, you know, the more proactive companies are, it's, it's a huge opportunity. And, and this is not going away, uh, especially in Europe with all the regulation. There's a decade's worth of work um, at the very, very least. So, yeah, real, real opportunity for companies if they if they seize it. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of, of Let's Talk Global Business. We'll be back next time with a focus on a new topic. You can find Paula's report on the S in ESG, as well as listen to the entire catalogue of podcast programming from the Conference Board by visiting our website at conference-board.org. Thank you, Paula and Andrew, for sharing your insights with us. I really enjoyed the conversation. And until next time. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you.